How's it going, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, shapes, and forms? Welcome to another edition, episode five of I almost said the Snazzy Cast. This is Anime What Do. Uh, <laughs> another episode of Anime What Do. As always, I am Greg, and I'm joined here by Mira. Say hello. Bom. We got a little bit of a guest today. She's finally able to join us for Anime What Do. She was part of uh, TSG before it was called These Snazzy Gamers, back when it was called Two Snazzy Gamers, and she finally now has time to join us on this Anime What Do adventure. It is the always lovely, always amazing, always beautiful May Brianna Mayanna. Say hello. Hello. And the three of us here today are going to be talking about our top <coughs> saddest moments in anime. Now, this is going to take a little bit of a, a, an explanation before we jump into the actual saddest moments. So if anyone is not familiar, we did a show back in December, from December to beginning of February, called uh, The Discussion Thread. And fuck that show, we're never doing it again. But if there's anything good that came from <laughs> it, it was our five-on-five uh, video. It was our five-on-five uh, five saddest moments in anime and five on five saddest moments of video games. And it basically was both May and I had a top five list that added up to a top ten. And um, uh, we counted down our status, our five personal saddest moments in video <coughs> games and in anime. And they were a lot of fun to write, and they were a lot of fun to edit too. And they came together really well, and I absolutely loved it. And uh, this was before Mira joined TSG. So when brainstorming ideas for Anime What Do? Mira brought up, well, why don't I do my own top 10 list or do my own top list of saddest moments in anime since I never got to do one. And we kind of brainstormed from there and May and I kind of also realized that we have since seen some shows and since rethought of our lists <coughs> and kind of redone them, rethought them, moved some things around and really put a lot more thought into the list than we did prior. So... We're doing this episode of Animal G right now. This is top moments, top saddest moments in anime. And uh, before we get into it even more, there's going to be spoilers abound throughout this whole episode. In the description, you're going to see the list of shows that are spoiled. <coughs> and if there's anything on that list you don't want spoiled, then uh, I don't blame you for being very, very choosy. Uh, but... If there's some shows you have had spoiled or you don't care about spoilers or you've already seen, but there's other shows you don't want to be spoiled, don't worry. There's a way that you can get around this. The way that I'm going to do it is this, is at the beginning of everything, we're going to say, uh, this first moment is from this show. And then we're going to explain uh, the moment. So like, for example, uh, so this moment, my number five on this list comes from Attack on Titan. And this is the moment. That way, you people out there have a little time to pause the video and skip ahead. <laughs> and all that fun stuff. But just just so you know, spoilers are abound. We're also going to have a list down in the description of everything that is, every show that is mentioned in today's episode. That way you know. So, spoilers are <laughs> abound. Another thing that I'm going to need to clarify. May and I are only going to have top fives because we already did top fives before and these are just a modified top ten, top five list. Since Mira did not get to do an original top five, we're granting her the ability to do a top ten list. That way, she can feel like that she's not missing out and anything like that. And the way we're going to do it is I'm going to let May explain her modified list first, then I'll explain my modified list, then we'll give all the attention over to Mira where she's going to go through her top ten saddest moments in anime Make sure you have your tissues ready because I'm sure we're all going to cry at some point because this is going to be a feels roller coaster up the asshole. So, with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. I'll hand the show floor over to May, as I like to call it. Go ahead and take us through your five sad, your modified five saddest moments in anime. Okay, so I kind of forgot. I think uh, top five I remember, and then. I can't remember beyond that. Like, I know what my number one and five is, so forgive me if I, like, blank out. If you had the list, Greg, oh, you're going to need list? the original list because yeah, I don't I remember. I have the original list on me right now. So don't okay, worry. so for number five I picked was, if you guys watched the video, it's still the same. It's uh, in Pokemon, the original Pokemon back in the day, is when Ash has to tell Pikachu goodbye because he, if I remember correctly, um, he finds a group of wild Pikachu and after like encountering them, he feels that Pikachu is better off with the wild group instead of with him as a trainer. So like towards the end, you know, he leaves Pikachu with this group and Pikachu is really upset. And you think and Ash is like crying. He's like, OK, bye, Pikachu. And it's really sad. And you think he's going to stay. But like towards the end, he does, he's, he, he goes with Ash anyway because he's like, oh, best friends. So there's that one. 
Um, you have to help me out, Greg. What number was number four? The original list was something from Evangelion 3.33. <gasps> Okay, so for number four, it's from the movie Evangelion 3.33, because uh, I'm sure a lot of people know that there's a show and stuff, too. Yes. But anyway, this okay. This is from the rebuilt. This is from the rebuilt movies. So that one is when, it's basically Kaoru's death, when they're in the um, the robot. And basically... When finally got in the goddamn robot. <laughs> yeah, when Shinji got in the robot. So basically, you know, Kaoru's telling Shinji... Don't don't pull this. Don't pull the lance out of the lance of I forgot what it's called, but he keeps telling him don't do this, don't do that, and Shinji just does not listen, and he does keeps fucking up more and more, and so finally you know because Kairu wants to help him, so what he does is he takes Shinji's collar off and he puts it on him, and like towards the end like something I can't remember what happens. It's been a while since I've seen the movie, but um something happens to where the collar gets activated. And so, you know, Shinji or Kaoru, they're, like, separated from this, like, barrier thing. And basically what happens is after a bit, the collar goes off and Kaoru's head just explodes. Yeah, and it's he dies. Brutal. And, and blood's everywhere. You see, it's like... But, um, yeah, so basically Kaoru died because of Shinji. He fucked up. He did. So, th- <laughs> so there's that one. It made me really sad because Kaoru's my favorite character in Evangelion. Rip and peace, Kaoru. Never Rip forget. Damn it, Shinji, why? Right. Now, you're number three. Are you moving on to number three now? Yes. Number three on your original list was Attack on Titans dub. Okay, so this one, this one, I'm going for the dub, to, to the dub instead of the sub. Like, I don't have a problem with subs. But, but we're just, dub trash, so. Just, the particular scene in the beginning, like, this isn't really a spoiler, because if people watch the first episode, but I'll just say it anyway. Right. So, it's the very first episode where, like, Aaron's mom is crushed under the building, and um, she's telling her kids to just, or her kids, because Mikasa's their kid, too, that she adopted. But anyway, um, telling them that they have to run away because the Titan's coming and whatnot, and Aaron doesn't want to leave her because that's his mom, because his dad poofs somewhere. Well, basically, in the dub, like, she's, like, screaming at Aaron, tell him that you need to go because, you know, otherwise you're going to die, too, and it's just... I don't know, like, just the dub, the acting in the dub really hit me hard, because they're like, she's like, you need to leave, and then, you know, Hans comes and takes Aaron away, and she gets eaten, and it's really sad, because Aaron's like, no, Mom, I'm going to kill all the Titans now. Can I, can I bring something up real quick? You bringing yeah. up that the dub hits you hard. That's yeah. what I love about the dub of Titan, because there's a lot of moments that were sad in the sub, but mm-hmm. in the dub hit me really fucking hard, like, mm-hmm. way harder. Mm-hmm. And like I'm totally with you on that. Like even from the word go, it's like oh shit, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was your number three, right? Okay, number two is a, a take code Geass. Yeah, it's code Geass. Okay. okay. <sighs> All right. So this number two is Alusha's oh, death, and FBO. and <laughs> it just I had to do it. It just it hits me really hard, like to the point of I can't rewatch code Geass. Because Lush is just one of those characters that I just got really attached to at the beginning. Like, I understand he's a bastard, you know, he did all this shit. He's he, shit, he, kind of. he he is a piece of shit. He's a manipulative, manipulative bastard. I won't deny that. He, you know, he did some shit that he probably shouldn't have done. But, I mean, you find out at the end, like, why he did what he did. But still, it just, he became my favorite character and whatnot. And so, when it comes to, you know in the part where Suzaku has to kill him, it hits really hard because Suzaku and Lelouch, they're like best friends. They've been best friends since they're little kids. Ah, So the fact that Suzaku has to stab his own best friend in order for peace to be obtained is really, really heartbreaking. And you know, you like, and everyone's crying because it's like, well shit, somebody died. And why not? And it just, I don't know, like just, that's just one, one scene that's, I don't know. It's just a really sad scene for me. Well, like it just more hit... fucked up is that there's only like one or two people crying over Lelouch when everyone else is rejoicing. Ye- that piece yeah, is basically alive. because that was his plan. That the entire the only reason he died is for that entire plan for peace because the world like from the beginning like he had this big old plan. Basically, he to become the villain, and so that when he died that world would the world would have chained peace. So in a way he kinda died for a noble cause. But still it's just really heartbreaking because Lush is this really he was this really complex character I just love. Right. He had many layers. He's like an ogre, you know. <laughs> onions. No he's layers. like an onions. Onions. Ogres have layers, onions have layers. But 
So yeah, so I just really liked, I liked his character and just everything and it just, just, and also that was like the very first anime show that had ever actually made me cry at the end. Like I was fine until like, what's her name, Colin, Karen, I don't remember, Colin I think her name is, she started crying and then, and then that's just when it hits and then later on, you know, Nunnally starts crying and I'm like, oh, fuck the show now, I can't handle it anymore. Fuck this, I can't. And Suzaku's crying in the suit and just, what makes it also tragic is that after that moment, Suzaku can never go back to being Suzaku. He has to stay a zero forever until he dies because of what he did. So it's just it's a really depressing scene. Like yeah. yeah, all this stuff. It just it it just hit me so bad I can't I can't watch right. Tokyo anymore. Maybe one day I'll watch it. Maybe one day. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. So so those were all the same I had. The so for the original list, number one what I had was the fight between Makoto and Haru in Eternal Summer. But recently I watched an anime called uh I don't know, Hana. Uh, and that just, a lot of people tell me it was, like, really touching at the end, and I was like, oh, okay, well, because I had never seen it. Well, I decided to watch it, and that show just brought me to tears. I could not stop can crying. I say, can I say this real quick? Yeah. So, I was sleeping because I had work that next morning, and I was staying the night at May's house while she was finishing it. I woke up to a message from May at 3 in the morning saying, help, feels from Anohana's ending. I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> but, so, so basically, so this was changed. So, let me preface the show, because um, I don't know if some people have seen it. Like, it's a really popular show, though. Like, a lot of people like have seen it, but still, okay. So, the show is about a little girl. Like, she's this girl, her name is uh, Menma. Basically, right. she's a ghost. She comes back, um, and she, she basically she has to get the Super Peace Busters back together, which was a group her friends made. Well, um, the main character, I think his name is Jinta. She calls him Jintan or something like that. Well, he's the only one who can see her, and so basically, she comes to him and she says, "I can't pass on until." my my wish is granted and you don't find out like till later on in the series what it is but so you know but what happened was when she was younger she drowned like there was an incident where uh they were trying to get the main character to say like oh do you like mima mima and he bullshitted and said no i don't like her because he was embarrassed because you know little kids they get embarrassed right, they're, not, yeah. they're not gonna tell you that well after that happened he ran off and so Menma goes after him, and then the there's another dude because the group consists of like three dudes and two guys, or three dudes and two girls, and I can't remember his name, but the other dude that's with him, he's like a blonde haired guy, uh, basically tries to confess his love to Menma, and she's like, I'm sorry, I don't like you, and he tries to give her a hairpin and stuff, but that doesn't work. Well, they never really show it; they only show like how like after she had died. But in that one little scene, basically something happened and Menma slipped and fell and she drowned and she was like eight or nine. So she was like a really small girl. Right. And so she comes back and so they have to grant her wish. Well, they can't figure it out. And, you know, the whole group is strained because she died and they are not friends anymore, things like that. Well, they eventually figure out what her, she figure out what her wish was, which was to, um, make the main character cry because she made a promise to his mom because his mom died as well so basically it just as this show goes on it gets really emotional because she's like crying because they they're doing some stuff and they don't mean to make her cry but she's just crying and everybody's crying because the show is too damn emotional <laughs> well <laughs> when okay so there's this like towards close to the end there's a really sad part where when her wishes start to get, her wish finally got granted, her body's starting to get transparent because she's starting to move on. And so he, the main character, Jinta, wants to make sure that they can all see her. They want to, they want to let her talk to them. She, he wants let her to talk to them before he, she passes on. So, you know, he's, like, running to the secret base. Well, there's a part where, you know, she falls off his arms, lands on the ground, and he can't touch her or, like, because she can touch him and stuff. It's weird. Ghost logic. But Ghosty there's the goose. part... Yes. There's a part where she can't... He can't even see her anymore or touch her. She's, like, invisible to them all now, like, including him. She was invisible to the others before, but now she's completely invisible. 
And, you know, but he can still hear her. So they decide to do, like, she she's lying and basically saying, oh, I'm playing hide and seek. She didn't want to tell him, like, oh, you know, my wish is granted. I'm starting to move on. So, but you can't touch me. Right. So basically they start to play hide and seek because that was, like, the one game they like to play as a kid. And while they're doing that, her journal, she had kept a diary before she died. She uses this diary to basically, while she's, because she's trying to prolong before she moves on, because she can't even move her arm anymore, because it's like basically, it's gone. Right. So she's writing with one hand and using the other hand and holding it. She's writing letters to all of them, saying oh. how much she loved them and whatnot. Uh-huh. And and all this while this is going on, they're playing hide and seek and looking for, her, and you know she's trying to give herself more time to hurry up and do all this, and she has to write like five letters because there's like five of them. Well, finally she finishes, and at the end, she gets the letters and puts them in front of this big old tree, the one tree that they used to hang out with, which was by the secret base, and she's sitting there, and they find it. In every single letter, she's basically telling them, like, oh, I love you because you're funny, I love you because you're amazing, things like that. And then to the main character, because they did love each other all along, basically in the letter to him, she goes and says, oh, I love you in the way that I want to be your wife kind of love. And it hits him really hard. Well, by the end, after they all read it, like, the sun's rising, too, at this point. So it's, you know, it's the scene, the show decides to be, become even You're more making me want to cry, by the way. Like, oh, my God. So by the end, the, they read the letters. They can all finally see her. And she stands up, and they're talking, and basically she's like, Telling them, like, oh, you guys have to say that you found me. You can't start crying and stuff. And everybody's fucking crying and everything because, you know, the letters are so emotional. Well, by the very end, like, afterwards, uh, after they read the letter, they say that we found you. And she's crying even more. And then basically she says thank you and she passes on. Fuck you, and, okay? And, <laughs> not. and so for that, then I decide right after the next day to watch the movie. Oh, no. <laughs> the movie basically puts that scene in again because the movie has some added scenes to it. Basically, in the movie, I'll just add it to it because it's part of Anahana. In the movie, they all write letters to her. The point of the movie is they're, you know, writing letters saying, like, hey, how are you? Thank you for your letter. And they basically burn the letters in the bonfire to show that she got, to say, like, oh, here you go, man, we're giving you a letter. And it goes in more detail of basically how she's struggling to write all these letters to them. And whatnot, and but yeah, eventually she does get a wish granted, and she moves on. That's but it's de- it's that's very it's very like it's a nice anime. It's just it's very feelsy. Like you'll start cry, you want to cry in random episodes because it's just right. it's so touching. Damn, that's crazy. Yeah. So this is beyond the point of not okay. This is no k. Yeah. No okay. So I'll say if you guys watch it, you're you're gonna cry. Like if I normally don't cry in anime, and this anime makes you cry, I know it's gonna be great. right. So. Oh, I'll probably cry because I'm an emotional wreck when yeah, it comes you, to yes. sure, I, when you If you watch a mirror, I know you'll cry because it's it's a very emotional. It's really good, but it's very emotional. Right. So there, that. Yeah. Sorry, so that, that's your I know, list. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I went on like a long. No, it's episode. okay. Hey, it's all good. I just, no, this is the I point, felt, man. I felt like that's the one show, like because it. You can't just say why the ending is sad. You, you have need to. to give, you need to preface. You it. have to. I have to preface why it's sad why they're right. doing all this because like and there's one part where they're you know at first they thought her wish was to see a, a a firework rocket be launched up into the air and explode but that's not even her wish and so you know wow. and it's just a lot of them had regrets and stuff so oh, that's, oh, shit, yeah man. so that's that sad. that's that's my yeah. list that's why i changed it because it hit me really hard i have i want to tell you guys this right now because we're moving on to my list my modified list there's only one moment from my original list that made it I com- I completely forgot what you were explaining. There was a moment in a show that I completely forgot that I wanted to add to the list, so I removed another one to throw that on there. Okay, so my modified list is way different because I've actually had time to think about it. I think I kind of rushed my last list. I really feel like I did because there's only uh, a couple moments that were kind of... And one of them is from the same series, but it's from the second season. We'll get into it. So my number five on my original list was Mad- uh, Homer's Backstory and Madoka Magica. My new number five is a classic one. It's Maeus Hughes' funeral from Atta- uh, Attack on Titan. Wow. What the fuck? 
It's well, my, I mean, it's my, military. My saddest moment at number five is me fucking up that Mayus Hughes was in Full Metal Alchemist. <laughs> no, number five was Mayus Hughes' funeral in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, and uh, it's weird. Full Metal Alchemist Hughes' death is way more depressing than in Brotherhood, but in Brotherhood the funeral is way more depressing than the death, because um, I'm gonna briefly get it. It's, it's an old spoiler, but still. So. Uh, Hughes tag your 11 year old spoilers tag your 11 year old spoilers uh, 5 year old for uh, Brotherhood if I remember correctly I don't remember when Brotherhood came out it was, ages, it was a while ago no but uh, so Brotherhood uh, the funeral is way more emotional to the point of like when Hughes' daughter starts breaking down and crying at the funeral as they're lowering Hughes' casket down telling 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 them that daddy's just sleeping. Why are you putting him in the ground? Like, fuck you, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then afterwards, you had um, Roy and Riza just standing at the grave. And Roy's like, um, and Riza's like, are you going to be okay? He's like, yeah, it's just raining. And he puts on this hat and you see his t- the tears start to fall. And you're just like, fuck you guys. Like, why? Why are you doing this to me? It's like, because you're remembering from the original series that Hughes died. But what makes it even a bigger fuck you is Hughes in Brotherhood dies in, like, episode 10. And it's a 64-episode show. You know, in the original series, he died, like, halfway through. And... This is basically a scene that's infamous for if you didn't cry at the scene, you have absolutely no heart. No that's heart, kind that's of, me yeah. then, because well, I, you did, I did not <laughs> cry at all. That scene was sad, but I was like, oh, he died. That sucks. The, the funeral, like I said, the funeral was way sadder. I was like, well, fuck, man. This is this sucks. It, it, made, it made me all sad and emotional and a little misty-eyed and stuff like that. So that was my number five. Number four on my list originally was the ending of Bleach Memories of Nobody. Uh, hmm. number four on my list now. Uh, so let's go home, Kaneki. So fuck say, you, man. That's all I was gonna say. It's the it's episode thir- Is it twelve? E- it's 12. I think so. Let me go check. Tokyo Ghoul Rude. It's the, the ending of Rude. Rude. It's basically it's the I call it. Let's go home. It's basically just. As Kaneki is carrying Hide's dead body down the um, the street, and you see like Toka's all fucked up because she's watching her whole life burn in front of her eyes. Uh, you see everyone's just kind of like, and all this bad shit's happening. Kaneki has like no emotion on his face anymore because his best friend is dead. And then on top of all that, you got the beautiful version of Unravel from TK playing. And it's like, that whole moment is just, it's really shockingly depressing. And originally, the this moment, uh, like, I, I'm going to tell you this right now, is that this moment right here, you would think would be higher on my list. I was more shocked than like, outwardly crying you know what i mean like i like tears were streaming down my face but i was just standing there with my like my, my mouth was open like this is really fucking happening what the fuck guys like what is this like i was more shocked than anything so like that's why it's a little bit lower on this redone list uh which then uh leads to my number three right number three on my list was a different tokyo ghoul moment it was Hinami's kind of breakdown at the end of episode 8. Uh, but my number 3 now is um the ending to Angel Beats. So I'm the only one here who's seen Angel Beats, right? Yep. Yep. I've explained the ending to Mira. May, do you even care about the I mean, we're going to I'm going to You talk s- I I I asked you in the parking lot once of a mall. Right, I was right. like just telling some not ever going to watch it. So this is one of the things that like how do I say this? It's really weird because there's a lot of really sad moments in this show. The ending in and of itself, like, I, I got to kind of preface this. So similar to kind of like what May was explaining with Anohana is that Angel Beats takes place in a sort of limbo. And everyone has to um, sit there and 
Um, wait, why am I saying the ending? I have it written down incorrectly. It's the ending to episode three of Angel Beats. Excuse me. So it's not the actual ending. It's the ending to this one episode. So um, Angel Beats is one of those say, one of those shows where they're all in kind of this limbo, right? And they can't pass on until they find out and achieve what it is that they wanted to achieve in their life when they were alive, basically. So earlier on in the show, you get this really cool story about this chick who plays music. And this moment, being somebody who absolutely loves music, and music has been something that has connected me with a lot of people. And it's something that to this day I still... As much as I'm not chasing it as a career, it's still something that I absolutely love. And I love just listening to music and stuff like that. And this episode, I would say it was episode three or episode four. I don't remember the exact episode number. Uh, But this episode in particular, it really hits home what it's like to be a fan of music and have music get you through something. Because you get this whole backstory of this chick who she found music at a young age. And it shows like when she first got into music. And it's just like, it shows her putting on the headphones and it's just like her world just turns into like this world of vibrant color. And it's like everything made sense when she had music on. And then she started to learn how to play guitar and she wanted to play in a band and she wanted to write music and she wanted to play to a crowd basically. Um, so the episode, she's a part of, this band that I think in show is even called a girl's dead monster. And you see them perform like at the beginning, but there's this one song in particular that was like, it was like her kind of like magnum opus basically. Like this was the song she wanted to perform for an audience. Cause it was a song that she poured her heart and soul into. And her, her goal was to be able to perform that song. Because she was absolutely in love with it. And so she plays this song. And it's like, it's just the crowd is just in silence. Because it's like, they're just in awe over this song. And she finishes the song and the crowd goes crazy. And then you see the guitar on the ground. Because she was finally able to pass on. And the rest of her bandmates just like, are kind of upset. You know what I mean? But they know that it needed to happen. And that really fucking hits hard. Because it hits what it's like to be a fan of music and to achieve some huge goal like that perfectly. And it brought me to tears. It brought me to tears more than the actual ending because of the fact of the whole music thing. And I absolutely love that moment. And I know I rambled on about it, but that needed some setup. So that was my new number three moment. That's so no okay. That is not okay, right? <laughs> it's it's weird. It's, it's fucked, dude. Like that show just has sad moment after sad moment, but that's the one that always sticks out in my mind is the, the music episode. Uh, so number two was my original number one. And number two on my original list was the ending to Gurren Logan, And number two on my redone list is Rin's breakdown at the end of season one of Free. And this was explained in the video, but I'm going to kind of briefly go over it. So Rin Matsuoka, he's kind of, I guess, the antagonist of, short, of sorts in season one for a good part of the show because he's kind of a dick to everybody. It's like he kind of turned his back on everyone. But it's like at the end, you find out he just, he feels replaced. He feel like he was easily replaced. He hit a really hard point. He wants to quit swimming. It's not fun for him anymore. And all he wanted to do was become an Olympic swimmer just to make his dad, his dad who had passed away proud and who kind of had a similar dream. And Rin has this breakdown at the end. He's like, all I ever wanted was just to be able to swim with you guys. You know, all that's all I had ever wanted. Yeah, and I'm starting. My voice is starting to crack already because it's just it hits. Because there's the, it plays with the whole abandonment complex of like, I feel replaced and I wish I had this opportunity again. And it's not fun anymore. And I just want to be able to swim with my friends again. And he just that's all he ever wanted in this whole breakdown. Like make a vouch for me. We watched epi- that last episode together, and I was bawling like a baby. Because Rin was my precious little baby. And I was like, this is not okay. And you see the for the team. And it's like, that's all he ever wanted. And it just, it it hit. Because Rin is the reason why I watched Free. 
Like, I wasn't a fan of Free at first, and then I saw this character. The first moment I ever watched a Free was the ending of, I think, episode 7, where Rin wins the race against Haru and says, Hi, never have to race against you again. That was my first introduction. That was my introduction to the show, and I said, I need to find out more about this character, and I absolutely fell in love with him, and I bawled like a baby when he broke down. So, that was my number one on my original list, and it's number two now, because it was trumped... By one of my goddamn triggers, which is suicide. If you, God damn it! Number one on my list is from Death Parade, and it's Chiyuki's backstory from Death Parade. Um, uh. And this is rivaled with Episode Four with the guy that commits suicide. <laughs> and the thing about Chiyuki's backstory, and this is why it trumps Rin's breakdown at the end of Free. This is the main reason. It involves suicide as the only means to be able to feel happy again. Because Chiyuki is the one of the main characters. She's the assistant to Deckham throughout the show. And you don't learn her name until episode 10, which is like way late in the series. Episode 11, you get her backstory. You find out she was a figure skater. She absolutely loved skating. She loved doing it. It was something she was passionate about. She wanted to chase it professionally. And she's, as she's revealing this, she's doing this ice skating routine in the Quindecum. And she's doing this lovely routine. And then she lands and you see her knee become like a mannequin knee. And she stops. And she remembers what happened. Her knee got fucked up. And she was told she would never be able to skate again. And... Like, the one thing she had always wanted to do with her life was be able to skate. And they basically told her, your knee, is, your knee is done. You cannot skate ever again. And she spirals into this, de- like, horrible depression to the point of she is no longer happy living. And the only way she'll be able to be happy again is if she's gone. Right. And she ends up slitting her wrists and committing suicide. And what drives that moment home is from that moment on when she's talking about it, her knee and her wrists are the the mannequin, are the the mannequin like a, a mannequin knee and like her wrists. The skin where chips she off, cut. basically. What? The skin chips off. Yeah, the skin chips off to make this like mannequin, like like there's a mannequin underneath her, and basically where she hurt herself and. It's it's such a beautiful moment, and it toys with the thing that upsets me the most, which is suicide, because that's a personal thing, that uh, it's something I've personally struggled with, and it's also why it's it trumps the moment with Rin is we said it in the spoiler cast for Death Parade that Death Parade knew how to talk about really touchy subjects in the best way possible, and it was able to successfully do that for suicide twice. And the moment with Chiyuki, when you find out that she committed suicide because she couldn't do what she wanted to do anymore. That hurts, dude. Like, to to think of, like, me losing my voice to not be able to do voice acting or losing the ability to function in a sort of way to be able to do internet content or do something creative, I would absolutely 100% end my life. Like, that is something I would absolutely do. And it it attacks that moment so well. It's not distasteful or anything like that. And it just really, really hits home on something huge in my life. Right. So that's my number one moment now. It's like it got it trumped because the Marin moment, it's abandonment complexes and feeling replaced, which is something I relate to. But the suicide thing is something I relate to even more than that. So that's why that's my number one. So that's my modified list. Now that we're already primed to cry, let's hand it over to Mira. You got your top ten. You're going to go ten through ten through two, do your honorable mentions, and then we're all going to cry at number one. So go ahead. you got the floor. Let's listen to Mira's top ten saddest moments in anime. As I hold my sadness plushie really, really close. Oh, I'm going to step into Studio Ghibli for a minute. We have the moment from Spirited Away. It's the ending. Basically, for anybody that hasn't seen Spirited Away, and I have no idea how you've missed this movie. (laughs) 
Spirited Away basically revolves around this girl named Chihiro, and she's moving to a new city with her parents. And their car, I think, like, I guess breaks down on the side of the road or something. She sees this bridge, and she goes through it, and it leads her to this other world. And she meets this boy named Haku. And so throughout the movie, you don't really know Haku's identity. You just know the fact that he can change into a dragon. And that he works for this person named Yubaba. Well, at the end of the movie, we find out Haku is the spirit of the river that Chihiro lost her shoe in when she was a kid. And so they find out at the end that Chihiro can finally go home, but Haku can't go with her because he's a river, and they've built houses over him. So she goes through the bridge, and she doesn't look back until she reaches the other side. And it seems like not really much time has passed, except for, like, her car is, like, covered with leaves. (laughs) Right, yeah. And then Chihiro finally looks back to see that the bridge is covered up, and she can't go back. Ugh, I remember that. Ugh. So yeah, little little Mira was like bawling like a baby. Oh. <laughs> I was like, what? why? Exactly. Because oh. Haku was always one of my favorites, and like Chihiro was super sweet, and I was like, oh. Why? <laughs> why? Okay, so that was my number 10. Number 9, I'm going to Attack on Titan. I could have talked about Marco, but instead I'm going with Armin. Oh. Because it was in it was one of the beginning episodes. You find out that Armin's grandpa has been sent to, you know, go look for food. And there's a scene where Armin is holding his grandpa's hat. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I remember this. I remember you telling me about this. I'm already tearing up. It's <laughs> yeah, okay, Mira. He find out that Armin's grandpa had died. And I'm just like, ah. You're like, no, my baby. Are you okay? Yeah. Are you okay? Are you gonna be okay? Ten, no. Honestly, you're getting teared up on your number nine, and I know you're number one. We're not gonna be okay. <laughs> Number one, I probably won't be able to speak. <laughs> right. Okay, so that was my number nine. Number eight is from number six. The anime number six. And the scene I picked was Xion's death scene. Whoa, spoilers. Tag your spoilers. <laughs> yeah. This was basically, it was in the last, like, episode or so. It was about, like, towards the end of... The second to last episode into the next one, or okay. something like that. One of those, okay, that makes sense. So, Nezumi and Xion are these two people. Xion came from the city, and he was sent, he was exiled to the, outside, the outskirts, which is basically where the refugees and, you know, the outcasts lived. Right. He meets this boy named Nezumi, who he had met actually when they were younger. And. Nezumi and Xion go to this tower to save Xion's friend, who has been possessed by what Nezumi calls mother. And they went to save her, and they're trying, and they're escaping because the tower is about to basically explode. Mm. They're running from soldiers who are chasing them throughout the tower. Xion and Nezumi are in this chute, or Xion's in this chute, and he's extending his hand out to Nezumi, saying, "You know, grab my hand. We're, you know." Come down with me. And as he's reaching out to Nezumi, Nezumi's about to take Xion's hand, and Xion gets shot. Oh. So, basically, they, they, all think Nez, they all think Xion is dead, and Nezumi's getting really upset. Like, they're trying to lead him away from Xion, and Nezumi will not go with them. And, I mean, like, later you find out Xion gets resurrected by Mother, but... It was just, Nezumi's whole reaction to Xion dying was just, ugh. It was just not okay. So they were, it, was, it sounded like they were almost ready to accept their fate together. It was no okay. It wasn't okay. I'm sorry. But what made it the saddest part was, like, Nezumi was starting to sing to him. And I was like, oh. Oh, no. It's, that is not okay. It was really no okay. Right, yeah. Okay, my number seven moment, you kind of touched on it, but I'm going to take it from the other side of that 
character, Chiyuki's passing from Death Parade. Ooh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Chiyuki is my favorite character. Oh. And as we talked about in Death Parade for the spoiler episode, Chiyuki, Chiyuki is already dead. And so Deckham played a trick on her to basically say, if you press this button, you'll be able to come back and see your okay, mother. this is the moment you're going with. Okay. Yeah. You're going with after you find out how she died. Okay. Uh, I'm going with her actual moving on. Oh, okay. There you go. So Chiyuki's having her breakdown saying she can't possibly do this because someone else would die. And she's getting upset because that means she won't be able to talk to her mom and say, I'm sorry. So they, the game is ended. Chiyuki is about to go to be reincarnated. She turns to Deckham and says, you know, you need to learn how to smile. And then the Gives, awkward smile happens. Yeah, Deckham has an awkward smile, and then she smiles back at him and goes to the elevator, and the door is closed, and she's gone. Yeah. And then the last you see of her is basically the mannequin that's dressed like her next to the bar. And that was not okay. And that broke my heart. Uh, <laughs> I was just like, how could you do this to me? How could this happen? <laughs> I made my mistakes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so for number six moment, I'm going with Danganronpa and I'm going with Chihiro's death. Okay, yeah, this is bullshit. <laughs> this is absolute bullshit because this, this is Nitori's thing. you. Game. This was sad in the game, but I was more like, what the fuck? Why her? Him? Well, yeah, because, like, for me, I I didn't play the game before I watched the anime, so seeing it in the anime broke my heart. Right, yeah. So, for Dang for this character in Danganronpa, Chihiro is actually a boy that dresses as a girl and passes as a girl. And then his episode, he's found hanging dead in the girl's locker room. And they're having the trial to find out who killed Chihiro. And it comes out, you know, that Chihiro is actually a boy. And the reason he had been killed was because he wanted to, you know, their secrets were revealed in envelopes. And basically, if no one committed a murder that night, their secrets would come out. And Chihiro's secret, or I guess was that he was a boy or that he wanted to be stronger. I know, I don't know, I never it got was, shown. It was that... He was a boy. Was a boy. It was that he was a boy? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, he went to... Oh, God. Who did he go to? He went to Mondo. Mondo. Mondo, that's right. I forgot who he was. That's right. Yeah, he went to Mondo. He went to Mondo because he thought Mondo was pretty much like a manly guy and he wanted to be stronger and he figured Mondo could teach him how to do that. Mondo got upset because it triggered his memory about his brother. And he killed Chihiro out of anger. Which was not okay. It wasn't okay. But yeah, the whole thing about Chihiro like dying because he wanted to be stronger, it broke me. Yeah. <laughs> and it broke everybody else. We're like, ah! I was like mad in the game when that <clears throat> happened. I seriously was like, every character I start to like a lot fucking dies. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Yeah, that's why people say don't get too attached to characters, because everybody is eligible to die. Right. Unless you're Nagi, because you're an egg. <laughs> Unless you're an egg like Nagi. Unless you're Nagi, because you're an egg. I like Nagi, because he's an egg. Because he's an egg. He is an egg. Alrighty, so now to your number five. Okay, number five is from Wolf Children. Can we just say all of Wolf Children, by the way? <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> I haven't that seen it yet. That is seriously like mainly, a really, really beautiful movie, but it's so mainly sad. The main reason why I may and I haven't watched Wolf Children yet is I don't want to cry. I'm I didn't want to cry either, but I was home alone and thought, this is the only time I'll get to watch it. I need to watch it. There you go. So, this isn't a spoiler because it's put, it's put in the summary for the movie. Basically, the dad, you find out... This girl named Hana falls in love with the man that can turn into a wolf. The wolf, the wolf man dies after she has their kids, and she has to raise the kids on her own. That's not a spoiler, and the fact that the dad died is also not a spoiler. But the spoiler for me is how he was found. Because when she was, after she gave birth to their second kid, who was the little boy, he was adorable. He was Micah's character, right? Yeah. 
Oh. And he was a sickly little thing, too. It was just like, oh. oh. But yeah, he went to go hunt for food for them, and he didn't come back. Oh. And she was starting to worry that something might have happened, so she took the kids and went to look for him. And it was already raining, so this is already a bad sign. It's already bad, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you see it raining in a movie like this, it's not good news. But she finds the body of a wolf in, like, this kind of, I don't want to say sewer. It could be, like, you know, where water runs under a road. Right. He, like a she found She found him laying there in wolf form with feathers still in his hair, and it gave the idea that he was hunting for food and he got killed hunting. So, basically, like, since he's a wolf and it's obviously a wild animal in Japan, they don't, you know, bury animals. They just put them in the garbage. Oh. So the people that found the body were putting him in the back of a dumpster, and they don't understand why she's crying. She, like, runs to this body yelling at them, and she just falls crying. Oh. Yeah. That's not okay. So basically the whole, the thing that killed it for me was she didn't even get to bury the dad. Oh, my God. I was just like, <laughs> That's not okay. And this is, like, in the first maybe 30 minutes of the movie, so I'm Fuck just like... that, oh. dude. This is why I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm already, we're, already we're doing this? I am, okay, listen. We talked about it on the podcast earlier that the virus cosplayer I met at AX said I'm prat- I am their headcanon Rin. I can agree on the fact that I'm a fucking crybaby, and that's not okay. <laughs> I am a fucking crybaby, and oh my god... No. Oh no, like I'm an emotional wreck for anything, so I know oh, that Phil. It's not okay. It's no okay. Me and Pablo for getting me that movie for Christmas three years ago. <laughs> I'm kidding. Love you guys. <laughs> anyway, go for it. All right, number four is from the same director, but it's a different movie. We're going with Summer oh, Wars. Summer Wars! Ah, oh, it's such a good movie. And it's obviously the scene that everybody that has seen that movie cried over Grandma? granny sake I didn't, cry, I didn't cry over it i said almost everybody okay i was like i didn't cry because <laughs> you're a cold-hearted person no i'm kidding you're not oh, cold. Okay. i'm kidding i'm kidding you cry trust me you cry it's just <laughs> certain things make you cry more than others yeah <laughs> So what happens in this movie is that there is a computer program called Oz, and it pretty much controls anything you do, from social media to running everything in a town. You have to kind of rely on it for everything. Right. There's the main character, he works for Oz with his friend, and this girl, Natsuki, basically invites him to a, her family reunion with the premise that he will pretend to be her boyfriend. I remember that, yeah, that was weird. And you meet the matriarch of the family, so- Granny Sake, who's who it's her birthday. Who is and they're awesome, having a birthday party for her, and she is a badass. I love her. She was great. I loved it. So something happens while he's visiting her family where a text gets sent out with the security program for Oz. And what happens is Oz basically gets hacked by this AI called Love Machine. And Just it pretty much machine. shuts everything down. So that's a love machine. And that night, something happened to Granny Saka. I can't remember if she had a heart attack or if just something happened. I want to say it was like a heart attack. There was something medical, like, like, like with the It body. was something with her heart. Yeah. But you wake up one night, or the main character wakes up one night to see people rushing toward her room. And they're freaking out. And he doesn't know what's happening. He gets over and he sees they're trying to resuscitate her. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> and they can't do it. And that was the moment everybody, everybody, their heart broke. Well, because, like, what makes it even worse is, like, she dies and the whole family's reaction is just basically everyone who's watching it, their reaction. They just, they're like, they really fucking did, why? (laughs) It didn't help that they read the letter that she left behind and that Natsuki had to tell Wabisuke about it. Oh, God, I forgot about that. Those parts killed me, mainly because Brina and Tatum knocked it out of the fucking park. Yeah. I'm just like, I can't even. It's that Palencia-Tatum connection. Oh my god, I know. It's like Black Butler all over again. It really is. 
It's like Tokyo Ghoul. No, it's kidding. They're both in Tokyo Ghoul, but not characters that interact like that. Well, speaking of Tokyo Ghoul, my number three moment, you've already brought hey, it up. Hey, let's go home, Mira. And basically, like, Unravel made it worse for me. But the whole thought of, like, Kaneki just saw his friend die in front of him. Just no. Let's also be real for a moment. What made it so shocking is that everything seems okay, and they're setting it up that something's wrong with Kaneki. And then you hear Hide say, I think I might have messed up back there. And you're all, Exactly! What? Wait. Huh? Oh, no. <laughs> and you're all, Oh, no. And you don't know what happened! Yeah, he basically just says, I think I got hurt out on the field. And it's just like, when did you get hurt? Uh, Who hurt you? Right. But yeah, that was my number three moment. <laughs> Fucked. That was, like I said, it was, it was shocking. So what's your number two? My number two is from Eternal Summer. Oh, is it? Is it what's related to what's on the screen right now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, no. Do you explain? I don't think I can. <laughs> it's okay. You can do it. <laughs> no, I don't think I can. Right, do you want? Do you need me to explain it for you then? Uh huh. Alrighty. So for Eternal Summer, her moment is Ray and Nagisa kind of breaking down and crying at the end of ep- or at the end in the middle of episode thirteen. So it's the classic case of sports animes have a cool thing where nobody dies. But they have a bad thing. The third years have to leave. And you get so attached to the third years. And what to kind of preface this whole moment is there's there's moments earlier on that like Ray Ray isn't from the swim team. He didn't grow up swimming. He was a part of the track team. And then he was kind of brought into the swim team by Nagisa. So um My baby. The, yeah, your babies. So um there's this whole kind of growth of uh, of Ray and Nagisa kind of like, you know, it's thanks to Nagisa Ray's a part of the team, and it's thanks to Nagisa bringing Ray in that he got to meet Haru and Makoto. And, and it's also him that formed the swim team in the first place. Yeah, it really was. And he was the fourth member that they needed, and they recognize that and make that make it known that Ray is just as important as everybody else. And, like, Ray has learned a lot from all three of them, but especially from, like, Haru. You know, there's, there's a lot of moments where Haru kind of just, like, gives him some advice and just helps him. And so they're standing there. They're getting ready for their final race together. And you um, you have this moment where Nagisa's kind of going crazy about, like, Oh my god, if we could do this, and it would be great. And then next year, we all get to do this again. And we all, you know, going on and on. And he mentions, and then all of a sudden you see Ray's hand touch Nagisa's shoulder. He's all, Nagisa, this is our last race together. Like, Haru and Makoto have to go on. And then Ray starts to tear up. And then he starts crying. And then seeing Ray cry makes Nagisa break down and cry. And they're just standing there crying because they they don't want that to be the last race ever. And then in comes Mama Koto to just hold them and be like, it's okay, guys. Let's focus on this last race. But it's just, it's their realization that this is it. Kind of. And it sucks, dude. And what makes it worse, for I'm sure, for, for Mira, is those are her babies. Those mm-hmm. are her, like, favorites. <laughs> Yep. And seeing them break down, you're like, that's not okay. And I still get upset when it happens. I'm like, no. What's going to make it even worse is Tatum and Greg Ayers in the dog. Oh, Jesus, my heart they is They already ready. made me upset in episode three. Because they hit that Regisa connection so well, in our opinion. Episode five will absolutely kill me. And then episode 13 will murder you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Rip Mira never forget. Rip Mira never forget. So now that I, gave Mira, I gave Mira a break. Was there anything else you needed to add for that one at all? No. Okay. So you got some honorable mentions before you jump into your number one. Yeah. All right. So, so let's list off those honorable mentions. Number ten was the entire bowling episode from Death Parade. That wasn't okay. 
<laughs> it was a happy episode, but it was not okay. That says a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine is Momiji's backstory from Fruits Basket. Right. Number eight was Holy Roman Empire leaves Chibitalia from Hitalia. Okay. Number seven was Kenshin's death in Samurai X Reflection. Ooh. That's a throwback. Yeah. That's a throwback, dude. Holy shit. And for anybody that's confused, that's one of the OVAs. That's not the show. That's from, from yeah, one of the Kenshin OVAs. That's the very last OVA. Nice. Number six is Kotetsu's death from Tiger and Bunny. Is that like in quotations? Quotations. Yeah, air quotes, yeah. Death. It's kind of like how Xi'an's was. His was in air quotes, too. Death, right. Number five is Okabe's quest to save Mayuri from Steins Gate. What happens to her? Basically, they find out how to, you know, travel back in time. An organization hears about it. They go to their house and they kill Mayuri. Fuck that. Why? And Okabe basically spends that a few episodes trying to go back and fix what happened to save her. Fuck, dude. And each time he gets it wrong and he keeps going back trying to fix it. So just imagine Tatum trying to go back in time to save Mayuri a bunch. No, that's not okay. (laughs) (laughs) Number four was Nagisa's breakdown in Eternal Summer. Oh, from episode five? Yep. When he's like the whole like... um, I don't want to quit the swim team. Ooh, yeah, that sucks. Because Nagisa's your favorite. He's my baby. It's a lot like why Rin's breakdown at the end of free season one hurt. Oh, uh-huh. and I'm that's gonna why cry, I'm saying I'm... this episode's gonna kill me in the dub. Oh, God, I can only imagine. <laughs> Number three is Marco's death from Attack on Titan. It wasn't half bad. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Number two is Sakura's suicide in Danganronpa. That that was a bummer. That was kind of a major bummer. I feel you on that. And then Asahina's reaction to that was just what made it worse. Yeah, yeah. Because she's like, that was my best friend. Why did you guys do that to her? You were so mean. Yeah, seriously. Just like, ugh. Right. And then number one honorable mention was Nina and Alexander dying in Full Metal Alchemist. Wow, that's... Yeah, that's that, not... beat, that beat Hughes' funeral. Yeah, I can imagine, because people <laughs> still are... <laughs> There's the guy at AX that had the... He was dressed up as Shao Tucker and says, have you seen my daughter and dog? Oh my god. And I was like, I saw that and I said, fuck you, sir. And then I'm like, can I get a picture? I said, fuck you, you're going to hell. Can I have a selfie? Right, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, so your number one moment. I want to preface this right now. We're going to have to help Mira through this one. Oh. Because, what? like, I don't know any details on this. You explained it to me once and you are going to cry. We're talking about Ooh, this. Okay, well, if she tells him, maybe I can help out. What's up? If she says it, maybe I can help out. Okay, okay so my number one moment is from Air. It's Misuzu's oh. death. This oh, is okay. not okay. Is that the main <laughs> character? Like, you have yeah. to give some details. Okay. And what makes it worse is Monica voices her, and I'm just like, no. Oh. So Basically. A- oh, go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to try and do it. <laughs> okay, go for it. You find out that in the show, Misuzu is a reincarnation of somebody in the past. And she's cursed to basically, when she gets close to somebody, like when she forms bond with someone, she gets sick and dies. And this keeps repeating. And finally, in this reincarnation, the curse is broken. But she's still dying. And so her mom had died in an accident and she's living with her aunt who just now decided to raise her like her own. Oh, just now. (laughs) Well, I mean, like she didn't know what to do with her. She wasn't really one cut out for parenting. So when she got this little kid, she didn't know what to do. Makes sense. So finally, like in the last couple episodes, she decided she's going to grow up and, you know, parent this girl as her own. So, Misuzu is basically getting weaker and weaker and weaker, and she's trying to hide it from her aunt. At the last episode, she's in a wheelchair and she wants to go to the beach. And she basically says she wants her aunt to stand at a distance so she can try walking to her. 
foot. It's okay. It's okay. Is it is the one where it says Yukito is a traveling performer who moves to the world? Blah blah blah. Is that the anime? Yes. Okay, because Self Animation has it now, so I will. <laughs> Yeah, Yukito is voiced by Vic, so spoiler uh, alert. So, you know what's weird is that you explain this, the summary is throws it off so much. <laughs> I'm reading the summary, and it's like, yeah, they want to, they wanna like, who is this girl in the sky? Does she exist? He wants to travel, blah, blah, blah. Dreams of living a life among the clouds. I'm like, what? Well, because that's this- what led him to meet Suzu, was he was traveling and he met her. And you find out he was also the reincarnation with her. Uh, and he helps break her curse. Oh, uh, okay. So then after he breaks her curse, he turns into a crow and sticks close to her. So Misuzu basically, like, she wants to walk to her aunt. She's saying, like, she has the strength to do it. So she gets up from the wheelchair and starts walking towards her aunt. And she basically says... Can I finish the crossing line? It's okay. It's okay. (laughs) And eventually she gets to her aunt and says, I did it, and dies. I'm like, no. (laughs) Have you seen the movie? Yes. Okay, is it the same thing? Basically, yeah, but the movie touches on, like, what happened to get her into, you know, the situation she was in. Uh, well, apparently it's a visual novel as well. I did not know that. Yeah. There you go. So, yeah, Monica, you ruined me for a long time. For the rest of your life. You just I mean... still can't watch that without breaking down. I'm oh, like... my God, it's an, er- it's an adult visual novel, so it's, like, erotic stuff. Oh, my. Well, because the movie, like, goes into what created the curse, and there is, you know, sex involved. Yo. I know, it's just funny. I'm just like, oh, there's, there's porn. Oh, okay. Right. And what made that death even worse was Lucy was voicing the aunt, and she's crying when she died. Um, that sucks. <laughs> she was basically going on like, we promised to be a family. I said I would raise you now. You can't just leave. And I'm just like, no. Like, why are you doing this to me? Yeah. So, so there you go. That's your list. Uh-huh. So, I don't know how else to end this, so I'll just go ahead and start wrapping it up right now. Thank you guys, uh. Thank you guys so much for watching. The Seals, Seals edition of Animu What Do. I uh, have an idea for a question, though. What is your question? Since we've all said our saddest moments, I'm going to direct this to audience. What is your saddest moment in an anime? I was just about to say, please leave in the comments below your saddest moments in, the, in anime. Like, what what broke your heart? What yeah, what <laughs> broke you to the point where you're like, this isn't okay. This isn't okay. Right, yeah. I, I want to find out as well. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, next week will be a lot more lighthearted because we're gonna be talking about probably one of the funniest shows that came out last year, and probably one of the best shoujo style shows that's ever been released. And that is uh, Genkai Shoujo Nozaki-kun, a.k.a. Monthly Girl Nozaki-kun. So we're going to be talking about a bunch of weird, funny, random shit next week. It won't be <laughs> uh except for May getting pissed off about the ending. So thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll catch you guys next episode. Uh, next week will be another episode of Snazzy Cast. But uh, we'll catch you guys next time on Anime What Do, where we talk about uh, Monthly Girls Nozaki-kun. So uh, take care, and see you guys later. Yeah, who needs tissues? Well...